Uh, my name is Kyle. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm one of the designers of Product Hunt. Uh, if you are not familiar with Product Hunt, you're coming from uh, the other side of this conversation. Uh, it's a community of millions of, of tech enthusiasts that discover and launch the best, newest, coolest tech products. Uh, feel free to check us out. Um, but today, uh, the goal of this call is uh, I'm here with uh, Nimrod Kramer, the founder and CEO of Daily.dev. And we're going to talk a little bit about building communities and building a uh, developer facing uh, company. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, we've also collected uh, questions from uh, some people in the product and community. Uh, and then we'll have time as well at the end if anything uh, comes up uh, along the way. So let's get started. Um, yeah, Nimrod, I guess for anyone who does not know, uh, can you maybe give a little quick overview of daily.dev and kind of the path to to building it and to getting it where it is now? Sure, yeah. So first of all, welcome everyone. Very, very happy to be here. I hope you find this session valuable. Uh, we have, Kai and I have prepared a lot of um, interesting topics uh, to share. So it's going to be an interesting one and there's going to be some questions in the end. So feel free to, to ask some stuff in the chat if we're going to be able to get to it at the end. That'd be nice as well. Um, so yeah, daily.dev. Daily.dev is a professional network for developers, um, which is a place where developers can come and stay up to date on everything that's happening in the tech ecosystem, which is rapidly changing and a lot of stuff happening. And it's also a place where you can um, build and grow developer communities and get basically all the knowledge you need as a developer in one place. And I think that one of the unique stories behind daily dev is actually how it started. So what a lot, a lot of people don't know is that daily dev started as a, as a side project, as a side gig. And when it was just initially launched, nobody has ever thought that it's going to be as big as it is. And nobody could imagine how big it can get the same way, the same way we see, we see right now with everything that, that we've built and with all the love that we've been getting from the global developer community so far. Um, so it all started from, from a lunch break, basically, um, where, um, Ido, my co-founder and, and myself and, and Sahi, our third co-founders, just sitting for lunch and Ido was complaining about how hard is it to, um, just consume news in, in tech and that there's like so many publications and so many, um, developers that are writing content and you get to go through hundreds of different places and invest a lot of time and effort to uh, just know what's going on in, in your field. And we said to him, you know what, you're, you're a developer, you know, you have the power to build stuff. So stop complaining and just, you know, do something about it. And we couldn't be less serious when we said it. And then next thing we know, we actually built something. Um, and we kind of like, started using it internally in the previous startup that we um that we founded and other people in our engineering department started using that as well and several weeks later we wake up in the morning and we see a spike in in our analytics and we go on and we see that there was a random guy from the UK who decided to launch us on product hunt in the time when it was kind of still cool to launch other products without consent I think that today, if someone does it, that's like can be considered very rude, I'm not, especially for companies. Like if you go and hunt someone without asking for them for permission, it's a contentious um, topic for sure. <laughs> yeah, so we're kind of like surprised, but you know, for what it's worth, we we enjoy a little bit of extra traffic, and from there, um, it really took off, and it was it was an amazing thing to see hundreds of developers um, starting to use the product uh, on a daily basis and starting to recommend it to. Um, to other other friends and other people, and and at some point, um, you know, when people ask me like, "How did you start Daily Dev?" Daily Dev actually started us. At some point, there was like so much traction, so much gravity. We said, "Hey, you know, we're gonna go full time. And we're gonna we're gonna build this thing." Um, so yeah, this is basically how it started. Ever since then, there's been a lot of adventures. We're gonna talk about some of them in the call, but yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, like, I guess much like Product Hunt, I feel like more people, a lot of people know the Product Hunt story where Ryan Hoover started it as basically a, a newsletter for for friends that was just an email um, and has since grown into something similar, but also very different. Like, how, what are like the biggest evolutions or like, how did it Daily Dev evolve from kind of that initial state to where it is now? So... 
it's gone through a lot of a lot of different transformations but when i look at it at at a very high level for a very long time we were hyper focused on solving one very very specific problem which is that it's really hard as a developer to stay up to date and the beauty about that problem is that it was underrated by so many people in in the industry but a lot of developers actually suffered from that on a daily basis so we were really deeply focused on trying to help developers unlock what's happening now and like any big problem when you start and go deep into the details you uncover you know how complex of a thing it is and like there's so many different preferences and so many different styles and 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 different consumption patterns and like and and, and even who is a developer we're probably going to talk about it is is also it sounds like um you know a one off definition but it's it's such a complex domain um so we've done that for for quite some time and lately we've started expanding into two new areas uh, that we can talk about later as well one of them is going from single player to multiplayer so daily dev is is kind of like a feed if you go on and, and see it that you can use and consume by yourself and engage with other developers on discussions and threads etc and we wanted to go multiplayer so we recently introduced something new we call daily dev squads which lets developers the ability to open a group with with other developers that they appreciate uh, it can be around a topic it can be around a particular city around a company around a project whatever you want uh, which is introduces a whole new dimension of like a multiplayer kind of network thing into daily dev. And the second thing is that we've realized that we gathered a lot of very valuable technical information for developers over the last years. So we've built a new AI powered search engine to help people retrieve things from the past and to help them find answers. So it's kind of like when you think of daily dev, it has like the past, present, future elements. So we help you retrieve knowledge from the past. unlock the present of what's happening now and build communities that would help your future um, is there a is there a hope there to be kind of a, a more casual stack overflow of like instead of copy and pasting my code to find uh you know specific solutions to, to bugs or that kind of thing that the repository of knowledge and daily.dev from the different places that it's coming for from that that becomes a, a similar sort of uh kind of knowledge base so, so i think that you know in terms of like how success looks like for daily dev i think that if we are successful then in several years daily dev is going to be the place where developers get everything they need besides writing their their code and building building the software itself so it's from learning and upskilling themselves it's going to be about participating in communities it's about collaborating with other developers it's going to be about finding a job and unlocking your next step in your career it's going to be plenty of stuff that that we want to build so effectively you can think about it as the home page uh, every developer deserves um, and when we recently did a press release around the seed round that we've raised uh, in the beginning of this year TechCrunch um, wrote a headline that that I was kind of like ambiguous about, but I think it describes daily dev in 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 a fair way, which is ready to meet stack overflow. Um, so it's kind of like in between. it's It's about the community, but it's also about the technical aspects and the things that developers care about. yeah, I think, yeah, and like like kind of diving off the the community aspect there, you obviously have, and you mentioned it a little bit before, is that you have a pretty hyper focused audience here, like, yeah. You know the developer community the engineering community would know there's a question of you know of obviously of like you know who what is a developer and that kind of stuff but th- does that make it having like a, a niche focus like that does it make it easier to build for for that type of community or is it harder to stay focused and you know not get tempted on expanding potentially beyond what the you you know, small cloud of, you know, developer engineering, those kinds of tools are, or that community is. Definitely. Um, so, you know, there's, there's like upside and downside to everything, right? So I think that, that with developers, one of the most amazing thing about focusing on this audience is that this is the layer 
in, in our economy that kind of like builds the future, right? They, they build everything that all of us are using on, on a daily basis. And building for them is something very special because if, if you manage to, to touch a lot of developers and to improve their, their lives and their future, you're indirectly impacting a lot of people worldwide, billions of people worldwide. And, and when we think about developers, it might sound like it's, it's a really niche or, or, or like hyper-focused, but the, but I think the, the, the most important, most interesting question is actually ask like, who is a developer? Like, what's the definition of a developer? And I think that the definition has gone tr through tremendous changes um, over the last several years. So when you compare software development to other industries, more traditional ones, I don't know, retail, insurance, finance, it's a fairly new industry, right? Like it, it's, it, yeah. it hasn't been there for, for a lot of time. And for the first time ever, we see a generational change in software engineering. So there's been like this founding generation, you know, the, the developers that built all the building blocks, they invented programming languages, they invented the basic concepts and methodologies, et cetera. And, and, and they built the ecosystem that we all know as of today. And then there's a new generation that, that is born into a well-established ecosystem that has a lot of tools, has a lot of opportunities. If you're a developer, you, you have so many choices that you need to make. You have um, so many tools that you can use. There's so many like learning paths and roadmaps that you can, that you can chase after. And, and the definition of who is the developer is expanding, you know, um, I think that right now it would be safe to say that the developer is someone who generally writes code, right? But the barrier to writing Maybe. code is, is changing. Maybe. Yeah. Because I mean, I think see... like I I definitely fall into like the developer light aspect because I don't write that much code at Product Hunt because we have a lot of very talented engineers. But on previous projects, like I've written a lot of front end, I can write Rails. Uh, but as a designer, like I like hacking around with like no code stuff. Like I play with Webflow, like you can build stuff with Zapier and, you know. Yeah, that's that's a great example. That, you know, I, I've just I've just went on LinkedIn the other day and I've seen like a job posting saying like, hey, we're looking for a Webflow developer. And I'm like, whoa, that's amazing, you know, because yeah. like building on Webflow, it's not, it doesn't really have a lot to do with code. But nowadays people are able to build apps and build websites and build all sorts of tools even without writing a single line of code. And when you combine it with everything that's happening now with AI, that really lowers the barrier to, to enter. Um, yeah, and I, I think, think it's there's exponentially, yeah. There's similar conversations too with uh, like design and photography as well with the AI of like, you know, if you're a really good prompt, like what what is a prompt engineer? Like obviously like, yes, you need to work with LLMs and like, but, you know, at some point it's, you know, who's creating the art if you're relying on Copilot to, you know, write your code, are you coding or is Copilot coding? Um, if I'm putting together a bunch of pieces uh, that other people have built, you know, am, did I code the website or am I just connecting a bunch of dots here? Uh, yeah, so I think that you're like opening up a very, very important discussion which we at Daily Dev really think um, people should talk a lot of, about it. And, and there's a very important question that not enough people ask or not frequently enough, which is what makes a great developer? What does it mean to be great? And how the answer is evolving over time, right? So for a very long time, being a great developer was in broad stroke, being someone who was able to produce high quality code. But that while this might still be true, it will change over time. So, and if it will change and a lot of people would be able to produce high quality code through the assistance of all sorts of tools that are not going to replace developers, but going to be there to really supercharge their, their, their productivity, then the next question is going to be, what will make you great? If everyone's going to be able to produce high quality code, what's going to be the thing that differentiates you? And we at Daily Dev think that it comes down to the core skills that you have as a developer, your creativity, your ideas your ability to uh, to design uh, and, and to combine different pieces all together into something that makes sense. And, and, and over time, we hope the daily dev is going to be the place where you get all these skills. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a tension internally amongst the community about like who daily dev is for? Because I know a lot of other communities have 
similar problems when they reach a certain scale of, you know, of growth that like you start building features that like they think aren't necessarily like specifically for them and they think that they are the core audience. Like, is, is there any of that kind of tension internally at Dev? Definitely there is like for everything we build, there's always a loud minority of power users who are very passionate about something that we've built and and with every change, you know, there is an ongoing conversation um, with, with these kind of, of power users that are really driving a lot of our growth. Um, and yet the more growth you unlock, the more needs you need to cater to, the broader the audience that, that comes into the product, the more niche you need to um you need, you need to support more more niche um so it's definitely changing um is there a debate around it i think to some extent yes um but it's, it's been mostly around how do you onboard someone so that they feel welcome and how do you uh, cater to all of these different interests in in a fun and delightful way which becomes more and more complicated the more you grow yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I think, you know, Hacker News is obviously an interesting example of like a very robust community that is not always the most healthy, um, especially when it comes to developers. Like, in inevitably, like the first, one of the top responses to anything on Hacker News is like, I could build this faster. This is a dumb idea. This is like, you use the wrong programming language. You should have done this in Go and not php or whatever um yeah like with a developer focused community are there are there challenges with how you approach product developments uh and opinionated users because your user base is so ingrained in i mean it's almost like a meta situation like a not, not meta the company but like meta just developers talking about development building developing developer tools like does that create some interesting conversations? Um, I think that it requires us to raise the bar with everything that we build. So one of the key things is in, in, in building for developers is being very logical and being very transparent. And as long as you kind of like combine both, it tends to produce very good results. But having said that, if there's one thing that we've learned in, in the last couple of years is that we're most likely to get a lot of the things wrong in the first shot. So, you know, as, as it doesn't matter like how intelligent and how experienced you are, at the end of the day, you, gotta exper you, you have to experiment a lot. So the thing that really makes the difference is, is speed and your yeah. ability to make as many shots and, on goal and admit when you're wrong and, and just fix that as fast as possible. And, and as long as you do that, you kind of like mitigating the risk of, of a lot of different backfires. Um, but, you know, as, as you grow the community and as your goals become more ambitious, the, the bigger, the, um, the dilemmas that you get. And, yeah. and then, and then it goes down to the core of your values and your ethics and what matters to you as, as a company and as a team. And uh, and sticking to these values is, is really, really important because that then aligns everything in, that's happening both outside the product and inside the product and in the team. And how do you communicate with people in the community and, and how do other people emulate that kind of behavior? Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, it's, it's challenging. And, and I think that for other developer communities that, have grown in, in different times, like the ones you've mentioned, like in Hacker News and also a lot of other Reddit communities. Um, there have been some some challenges in, in creating a, an inclusive and, and healthy culture. Um, and, and we hope to do a little bit better job, but, you know, there's still a lot to prove. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned, I, I feel like this is a good, a good segue. You mentioned a little bit about, you know, interacting with the community and, and how you approach product development and that kind of stuff. Uh, how does, like your product roadmap, how much is that influenced by communicating with the community and like, how are you gathering feedback or beta testing? How much, and I know there's been some conversation over the last 
I would say like year particularly about like how much people actually like building in public because there's been so much like not st I mean stealing from for for lack of a better word or, or copy copycat stuff but how do you interact with the community with regards to product development uh, at Daily Dev? Um, so I think the the roadmap is 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 a combination of being very obsessed with data and making sure that we build things that that would actually improve our users' life and having a qualitative um, discussion with with a lot of people in our community. Um, and there are some some things that we build purely based on data and some things that we build purely based on user feedback and some things are kind of like a combination. But when you think about the large strategic initiatives like squads, these things are normally being driven by the discussion we have with the, with the community. So squads is an idea that was born from within the community. We run an annual survey where thousands of our, of our community members have answered and one of the things we were very innocent about is that we asked a lot of open-ended questions, right? We wanted to see how people express themselves. And then we got like thousands of responses on tens of different questions, which yielded like tens of thousands of open-ended answers. And then we were just a team at the time, like just a team of 10, we're like sitting in front of this, this massive Excel sheet. We're like, how are we going to process it now? You know, it's, it's such a mess. So we found a company um, in San Francisco to kind of like analyze everything for us. And and they really helped us distill the this kind of notion that people just want to be able to to form groups within the product, and that sparked the initial idea for for squad that that's now um, being very positively received um, in the community. But with other things uh, that are more tactical, I would say it's it's a lot of just A B testing, a lot of lot of data driven work. Nice. And when you are building stuff, how do you balance the tension between uh, like something that looks nice and something that's functional and ships fast. Uh, like I, th I think there's been like traditionally the the like idea is that developers don't build things that look good. Um, and so you know you would think that something like daily.dev, a product for developers built strongly by developers, you know theoretically would not. But obviously, you guys have done a very good job in, in with UX, and and it and it does look quite nice. Like, how do you balance that that kind of tension internally? All right. So first, just to be fair, the site didn't look as nice as it looks today. You know, in the early days. All right. So we did a lot of like quick and dirty things, and a lot of like hustling. And again, one one of the things that not a lot of people know is that we actually built the product from the ground up. Like literally, like we pressed new project and built the whole thing three times which is something very important about scaling any company, but in particular companies that are built for developers, we can talk about that as well. And in all honesty, we don't balance between, <laughs> between functionality and, and how good things look like. Um, and I think the reason for it is that the standard of, of products and software in the world has gone up a great deal. Right. Yeah. And, and, um, and nowadays, even when you're looking at developer tools and different companies, they put a lot of emphasis on brand. You know, if you go 10 years back, that would have been even an insult or something like if, yeah, if you would go on a developer tool, you say, hey, you should invest in your brand. They would like, I'm not going to talk to that person ever again. But yeah. now, nowadays, it's 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 very different. Um, yeah. And I think like a lot of com I mean, companies like Stripe, I feel like changed that a lot. Like they just invested so heavily in, in brand and design and you know, and just put that at the forefront of a lot of the things that they were building. And like more recent examples, I think Linear is, uh, you know, kind of the darling of both the dev and the design world right now um, as a product that, you know, just really balances like a high quality focus to literally everything they ship and both on the design and the engineering side. Um, yeah, someone told me once that, you know, design used to be the like cherry on top of an interesting product. And now it's almost the, like the barrier to entry. Um, it's almost the table stakes. Like you have to have something that's at least somewhat decent. Otherwise people will be like, yeah, there, there's going to be something that's similar that looks better or works better out there. Definitely. Definitely. Design, design is an inherent part of, of 
daily devs culture and, and product development process. And one of the things that not a lot of people know is that the, the founding team is comprised of a hacker, a designer, and a hustler. And since I'm not a developer myself, and I'm not a designer, you can fill in the blank on what I do on a daily basis. But we actually have one of our co-founders, which is a designer. And I asked on Twitter, like I said, like I challenge you to name a developer facing company where they have a, a, a design a designer founder. And then someone said linear. And I was like, all right, we're in good company. Um, <laughs> but there, there aren't many. And I think we're going to see more uh, in the future. And that, that also changes like the, the profile of founders who are starting companies for developers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, see, we're about halfway through. So I feel like it might be a good time for you to give you some time to talk a little bit more about squads potentially and these new features that um, honestly are, are kind of changing like the, the way that people are able to use daily dev. Um, so maybe like a, a little bit stronger, a little bit longer background on, you know, why you think squads are important, uh, and, and how you see that enabling or, or, or changing the way in pe which people use daily dev. Sure. So, so I think there's, there's like two angles to it. Um, one angle is the, the developer kind of like point of view and how this thing caters to their needs. But there's also the the community builder point of view, which is kind of like a new player that's all of a sudden being introduced to uh, to the game with daily dev. And for many, many years up until now, when you think of developer communities, they mostly live on places that were never designed for developers, which is a very strong signal, right? Because when you build something, you want, you want to see that people are passionate about what you build and they're so passionate that they're trying to find hacks, trying to find like all sorts of different tools and ways and go arounds to, uh, to cater their need and solve their problem. So people have been doing that on all sorts of different platforms that were never designed for developers. And what we're trying to do with Daily Dev is that for the first time ever, there's like a dedicated professional network just for them where they can both discover um, relevant groups and relevant uh, relevant squads, and they can also open ones. Um, so this is one, one side to it. Another side to it is that if you're building a community, it comes down to either you choose a platform where it's like mainstream and it has discoverability. I don't know, we can start a community on Twitter or you know on, on, on different like uh, mainstream uh, social media, but then it's really hard to kind of like build and 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 collaborate with, with your community there because it's not it's not really a closed group and and you you get your content blended with a lot of different topics, right? right. And then there's like a different strategy, which is you open a Discord server or something similar, right? And then it's really hard to grow it because because you got to bring, you know, every developer very manually. Like you have to invest a lot of efforts in growing that community. So on one hand, you want to have a place where it's like the context is hyper-focused for developers. All the conversation there is around development. And on the other hand, you want to have discoverability so that the more the, and the better content and the better things you do with your community, the more exposure it gets. And with squads, we're trying to kind of like combine both worlds. It's a platform for developers. All the content there is already made just for developers. All the users are developers. But then when you open a squad, you actually also have the opportunity to get discoverability and bring in more people um, to your group. So that's kind of like the big promise. Um, for the time being, we, um, we are being very careful about um, giving this kind of, um, this kind of superpowers um, to everyone. And, you know, just like the App Store or Google Play where, you know, the best apps on the store get a lot of exposure and, and these companies have a lot, a lot of interest in having like great, valuable apps. The same way Daily Dev has a lot of interest in having very valuable, thriving and healthy communities. So if, if you're building a great squad and you put in the effort to bring in the content and some initial traction, we have a very strong interests and very happy to try and help you drive it forward so um so that's kind of like the the gist of it and then and, and, and yeah think, like it's go ahead no no no. go ahead yeah. i was gonna say what do you think the biggest challenges for for daily dev with regards to squads and, and building these types of communities are like like what are the risks like what are the risks and pitfalls that might 
cause something like this, which on the surface seems like a, you know, a, a no brainer feature to like not work or like, or not work in the way uh, that it was intended. Uh, that's an amazing question. There's actually way more reasons why it won't work than reasons for <laughs> why it would work, right? So just touching a couple of them. One is that when you try to build a network and eventually like any group product like squads is, is a network where you have people who post and publish and there are people who consume and you want to bring them together and match their like intents in, in the same time. There's some sort of a cold start problem. That's one of the biggest challenges to solve for any yeah. companies. Um, daily dev has this kind of like unique advantage that we already have hundreds of thousands of developers that are using the product daily. So we, so they get to interact with squads on very different occasions. So it's not only about squads, they get also their feed and they get the AI search and they get a bunch of other stuff. Um, so, so one challenge is to build a network, which is common for, I think any, a lot of startups, including marketplaces and, and, and whatnot. And another thing is, is in the is in the content itself. At, at the end of the day, if, if people do not produce high quality content and not creating interesting, valuable conversations, then why are we even doing this? And I'm not I'm not talking about you know trust and safety issues. Th that goes without without saying. You know that there's a lot of bad things in the internet, and no platform is is immune to these kind of things. So moderation and things like that is is obviously very important. But at the more positive side of things. It's really important to bring in high quality content. One of the things that we've been doing very focused on is that we started squads with ones that we own and operate. And for each one of these squads, we brought a lot of thought leaders from the industry. So we started with an AI squad. We brought their thought leaders from OpenAI and Google DeepMind and a lot of other AI companies that are really you know, setting the tone in what's happening now. So that they are able to both participate in the conversations and also post really the most interesting high-end stuff. And we do the same thing for web dev and for DevOps and for a lot of other fields. Um, and that's really important for other people to then emulate this kind of quality when they post. Yeah, the, the, the quality thing I, I think is an interesting one because obviously there's there's a balance between you know engagement and, and quality and you know i'm curious cuz product hunt has has similar issues of like how daily dev looks at how are you guys main, trying to maintain like a healthy community that is both like valuable and you know community driven but also is surf is really surfacing like the best types of content or the best content for this particular individual yeah, so we have a very strong platform team with um, great engineers that are really good at building feed algorithms. And when you think about all the content that's being created in daily dev, there's plenty of challenges. So there's like thousands of, of pieces of content that, that get in every day and you want to give all of them or most of them some sort of an opportunity to get exposure. So that's like one challenge. Then once you've given that the um, the opportunity to to get exposure, then how do you proliferate it? Like how do you expand the the exposure beyond, and how do you do it without compromising quality? So a lot of times the things that get a lot of engagement are clickbaits and things that you know are are not really um, there to provide value. Um, so it's tricky and and it's an art. And it takes a lot of time to crack. And in the very early stages, I think one of the things people could not appreciate enough is that there was a lot of manual work. Yeah. And even to date, we review every single piece of content that goes onto daily dev. So if you run a blog or if you run a publication, we manually review each one of these things to make sure that what comes into the platform satisfies certain content guidelines. And that's a lot of work, you know, when you think about it and, and it becomes even harder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we work through a lot of similar stuff at product hunts and, you know, it's always a, a, a challenging conversation of people that just don't understand how much like work the team does to maintain any level of any quality that's, that's possible. Um, I mean, do you guys run into issues around, you know, a, a, as you've grown and become an incredibly valuable community, you know, hundreds of thousands of users, tons of page views every day on, on the extension. 
Like, have you run into issues of people trying to back channel, like trying to artificially get themselves promoted because of the perceived value? Definitely. And, and you know, you're again, you're talking about developers. So it's not the, not only some of them have the intent, they also have the capability and the combination yeah. of having like the, the intention and the capability can be very tricky to handle. Right. Um, so, so we've definitely seen these kind of things and we've also seen a lot of people who get frustrated when, you know, when, when it gets hard to manipulate and do, and do a lot of stuff. And what we've seen is that the more passionate people are sometimes the more unfortunately the more harsh they are and um our, our product manager sav he said like an amazing thing the other day we got this very long user feedback which was you, you could see the passion but the language was was really really toxic and really offensive yeah and he said you know the opposite of love is not hate so what you see here is, is someone who actually cares a lot and and just wants to have a a very good product and and that helps empathize with um with people at the end of the day they, they want to get good service and some of them know how to express it in in a certain way and some people choose different ways but seeing that passion is actually a very good signal when you think about it yeah you know if people aren't reporting bugs or aren't giving you feedback that's not a, that's never a good sign like if you want people passionate enough about or seeing enough value in what you're working on to take the time, honestly, to write any level of feedback, whether it's a couple sentences or I don't know, sometimes we get ridiculous like essays about things that are wrong with product hunt. And I think that the, the balance there is being able to do it in a way that is both productive for you and is received well on the other end because it's written in a way that is like receptive to like, hey, like things aren't perfect. And I don't know, someone once told me like, designers often have this problem with with critiquing other websites and, and that kind of stuff that the, the people that are that are most aware of a product's shortcomings are the people that are working on it like you're 100%. probably you're probably not telling them something they don't already know um like sure there's bugs that you don't catch but like if, if you're talking about like ux issues and those kinds of things like they're probably aware of it it's probably in an Asana or linear or, you know, notion or documented somewhere, but there's limited time, there's limited resources and, you know, people are trying their best. So it's always best to approach those kinds of situations in a, in a way of like, Hey, like, you know, notice this it's affected my experience would love if it got fixed. Um, but not like you guys are the worst ever because my problem hasn't been solved yesterday. Yeah, definitely. But one thing for sure, we, we the, the friction that, that we see is something that we very much appreciate. And we're very yeah. lucky to be in a position when we have this kind of friction because it just gives us the opportunity to build something that's, that's much better. But yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, um, on, on a more positive note, <laughs> uh, I, I heard... Uh, some some rumors about swag you guys have given out lego sets like uh some kind of game uh like tell me a little more about this all right so so i think that kind of like brings us to the point where i'm just going to expose the biggest secret in <laughs> building for developers and doing marketing for developers i've seen a lot of questions coming from the product and community about marketing specifically right i think that Developer marketing is everything but marketing, all right? So this is this is something that I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't emphasize enough. And um, and when you're when you're talking to developers, you have to assume, and that that should be like a starting point. You have to assume that they are among the best. Sorry for the language. They're the best bullshit detectors in the world. So if they smell even like, like the slightest piece of like marketing jargon, that wouldn't be received well among many of them. So what you should care about is authenticity. And one of the ways to produce it is humor. And it's catering to things that are common. You know, developers, everyone likes to build. 
And when you build, it comes with a lot of pains and a lot of suffering. You know, we've mentioned like some jokes around bugs and 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 issues. You know, um, and 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 talking about these things, even if that's not about your product, many times help people uh, kind of like relate to to what you're doing. And one of the ways that we're trying to kind of like spark love, if it makes sense. I know it's not measurable, but it's it's really a lot about building building love and building brand, is through doing things that other people say that are extraordinary. Um, so one of the things we we really love is coming up with crazy swag ideas. So we've had this idea of a custom Lego set of a developer workstation with a daily dev tab on it. And a lot of people went crazy to kind of like get these Lego sets. We might actually redo it in the future. And there's been like uh, shoots and ladders, like snakes and ladders game for developers where we actually design an entire like physical box game and we sent it out to a lot of people in the community and there was a lot of humor and and we've seen amazing stories coming through that game of you know parents who code and they spend a lot of time with in, in their work and all of a sudden they have like a good way to introducing their work with their family with their kids that was like really lovely and you know and we, when you see this kind of connection and when you see them sharing it out there and 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 people relate to that. This this what builds um, the relationship between you and 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 all of your community. Um, so yeah, of course there are some, you know, um, standard marketing things like you gotta have a site, you gotta have messaging, you gotta do this and do that. But um, but it, it's really the messaging shouldn't be about pure marketing. Yeah. And when you're talking about some of these like, kind of ideas, where are they, are they coming organically from different parts within daily dev or do you have like marketing dedicated people or is this just like, you know, Nimrod's like, Oh, you know, what would be actually kind of cool. Like if we did this thing. So I think that very, in a very similar fashion to how daily dev started, which was kind of like lunch, lunch break joke. So a lot of the campaigns are starting off as a joke. Like, hey, it would be really cool if we've done this and that, or that would be really funny if someone have done this. And then we're like, wait a second, let's actually do it. Like, um, so a lot of these things uh, happen this way. There isn't one person who says like, hey, we're gonna do this. Like, it really comes from, from, you know, the engineers and the designers, and and we have some marketing folks, of course. Um, but it, it, you can never know where where the next big idea would come from, which I think is is really an amazing thing. And in daily dev, one I think one of the unique things about how we built the team is that a lot of the people who work for us are power users of daily dev that we just offer them to kind of like join the company. So it's always good to have very passionate people who feel not only that they build for themselves and for something that they personally love, but for also for other people that they know. Um, and and when you have this kind of situation, then you can you, you get all sorts of crazy ideas. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible superpower almost to have people to have people working on a product that they actually use uh, on a daily basis. And this isn't always possible with with every every type of product. But you know, as as much as you can dog food things, like if you're if you're a developer and you're working on daily dev and it's in your tab every day and you're using it every day, you're gonna have such better insights than someone who doesn't use it. Um, and that's like something that I think isn't always, isn't always appreciated across different types of companies and, and that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, just a very cool opportunity to have to be able to work like that internally. Definitely. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, I have a couple questions here that we've already gotten from the product hunt community. If anyone who's currently on the call has a question that has come up in your mind in these conversations, please add it to the chat. We'll we'll try and get to it. Um, and we'll try and work through, just work through some of the stuff that um, has been sent to us already. Um, how does Daily Dev ensure consistent value delivery in an ever-shifting landscapes uh, landscape of developer needs and like tech changes? All right, that's a fantastic question. I think the one of one one of the job 
of, of any founder, any builder is to just know your industry and know the people you're building for very, very well in and out. So I personally spend a lot of time doing research, trying out new products, talking with people uh, from within from within our community and really, really listening carefully to, to, to what people want. But I think that this is about what we positively want to do. I think that one of the areas that um, that builders and founders should be careful about is is trends. You know, trends is a having a trend, and and we've seen all sorts of trends in tech in, in the last several years. There's been like AR, VR. There's been you know Web three. Really? There's been yeah. crypto. Now it's AI, and and yeah. and I think that one of the most important skills is is being able to identify a fake trend and a real trend, and that's a skill. All right, and there's been plenty of write-ups from, you know, industry titans, from Y Combinator, and, and a lot of people are, are talking about it. I think that at least for me, the the gist of, of identifying a fake trend versus a real trend is on, on retention and how much people are actually passionate about it. So even if, if it looks weird, a product, like a specific product might look weird, but you have a certain set of people who use it very passionately all the time, then it gives some sort of signal that that it's real versus you know other products that you know a lot of people are hyped about and they just try it one time for the sake of saying I've tried it and then nobody's using it ever again um that's normally like a, a sign that you know while this is a trend it might not stick around for a lot of time what do you and, think the biggest non trend is currently for engineering and development the thing that it that appears to be popular but is probably not going to last. That's a very tricky question because one <laughs> of the things that we, one of our guidelines actually when fostering um, a global developer community is trying to be neutral. So oh. we're being very careful about <laughs> expressing our opinion as daily dev on on various tech trends, and the reason for it is because we see ourselves as facilitators of debate, discussions, and letting these things happen. And we think that once we express our opinion, we're kind of like not in a position anymore to facilitate a neutral conversation and bring all voices around like around the table. So although I personally have some some opinion around some some various trends that I think will, will not last. Um, it's it's kind of like tricky to share them um, publicly because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And at the end of the day, I'm I'm wrong with most of the things that they say. At least fifty percent of the things that I say end up being just wrong. Um, but I think only time will tell what's what's real and what's fake. That's for sure. That's fair. That's fair. Um, let's see. There's a question about uh, maintaining company culture, um, especially in like remote settings. Do you guys have any specific ways that you approach? Uh, you know, keeping the team connected and, um, you know, motivated and, and those kinds of things. Yeah. So, um, so, so when speaking about remote, I want to start with, with this notion that I think that with, with COVID and everything that happened, a lot of people started getting remote and, and giving interpretation to what remote means in, in different ways. All right. So when when like 10 different people would say remote, they would think about 10 different working models. Right. So so when I speak about remote, I'm speaking about remote first or remote native companies, which means that those companies are. Have strategically decided from day one that they're going to be remote, they were not imposed on to be uh, to be remote because of whatever global circumstances. And these companies tend to very well design their culture, their work processes, and their communication around working remotely and being effective and working remotely. I think the the, the best example out there probably is, is GitLab, which is like a developer-facing company. It's a public company from tens of different countries, hundreds if not thousands of, of employees worldwide, no offices. And and that is, that that is cool. one of the... yeah. Which is which is like really, really cool, yeah, definitely. At least for us at Daily Dev, it's a combination of a lot of a lot of internal education on how to communicate effectively, 
how to give feedback in a remote setting, how to um, how to build a relationship, how to communicate async, and and a lot of things that that sound simple, but in a remote setting are actually not. The second thing is that we deploy um, and we use different tools that are dedicated for working remotely. I think the the best example is that we have a virtual office, um, which is which is a very cool app called Gather Gather Town. Uh, I don't know if you encountered it in, in the past. And it mm -hmm. just lets us know who is right now in the office. So it's it's such a simple thing. Like who's working right now if I want to bug someone? You can just go under to their desk and and have a meeting. Or if someone is doing a one-on-one, -on -one, you can see it. Or if there's like a product development sync, you, you see that this is currently happening. So uh, you get a lot of context. And most importantly, you feel less lonely. And then lastly, we do have physical gatherings which, you know, the fact we don't spend a whole bunch of money on an office means that we have a little bit more budget to get people to travel around the world and meet, meet physically. So just a couple of weeks ago, we met in, in Warsaw in Poland. We brought all of our team members from all over the world, from the Philippines and Australia and, and the UK and Israel and Italy, like all sorts of different places. Uh, we brought them to one week in Warsaw where we worked side by side and we built a lot of stuff together. And... The most unique aspect of it is when you're working fully in office and your boss comes and tells you, hey, we're going to go to this one week offsite with all your colleagues. You're like, oh, man, I don't want to see these people. And like, I'm, I'm sick of these people, you know, but in a remote setting, it's like meeting in person one, like once or twice or three times a year. That's like the most exciting part of the year because you haven't seen these people. And all of a sudden you get to interact with them. You get to go to dinner and eat with them and and have a lot of fun with them. So. And, and that changes the perspective and that forms amazing relationships. Um, yeah, we just actually had, I'm, I'm wearing the hat actually. We we just had a, an offsite in Portugal where we brought together uh, a big portion of the team at, at Product Hunt that all, all the things you're saying, you know, you're excited to see people, you get to talk about things and work on things and uh, in a different way than, than you get to remotely. And it's just fun, so. So what was like the most meaningful moment for you within that? kind of like in-person offsite? I mean, it, I think we there's a lot of people that you, like when you're, when you're a growing team, there's like just a lot of people that you don't interact with on a daily basis or you like, they get hired or they're on the sales team or they're on, you know, a, a different team that you just have no... There, there, there's a very difficult to form like a personal connection with that person and, and have an idea about, you know, how, how they work, how they communicate and, and those kinds of things. And I think it's really powerful to like meet all those team members in person and, you know, in one place and get an idea of, you know, the things they care about outside of work. And, um, you know, the, the, the like, I mean, we have a water cooler channel in, in Slack that we share some of those, those kinds of things, but it's not quite the same as, you know, going off on a ridiculous tangent on some topic in person uh, yeah. with those people, uh, which I think is just really, um, really powerful. I think that one of the most beautiful things that one of our team members have said after the last gathering, it's, it's one of the... Um the newest members of the team. I asked them, so how was your first experience doing doing an offsite? We already had a bunch of these. So for, for that person, it was the first time. And he said, I, I felt that I have a friendly relationship with everyone on the team, but now I feel that I can call them friends. Yeah. And and that's very powerful. Yeah. And it's also fun to see who's tall. Uh, Cause- Oh yeah. <laughs> you don't realize that you don't really get a good sense of height on Zoom, which is always fun, always a surprise. Um, we do have one question in chat. I, maybe you know this one. I'm not familiar with Hacktoberfest, but the question is, how does Hacktoberfest affect daily.dev? Do you have any idea about right. that? So, that? Yeah, that's that's a great opportunity for a shameless plug. Daily Dev is also an open source project, which means that a lot of the code is out there. You can you can go ahead and, and look at it. And Hacktoberfest, is for anyone who is not, is not aware of it, is, is like a month, always in, in October where a lot of companies, a lot of open source projects and the entire developer communities get together around contributing to open source libraries. That these libraries, you know, they power a lot of the, the products that everyone is using on a daily, daily basis. And us, like many other companies, we also participate in Hacktoberfest. And 
Uh, this year, we decided to put emphasis on our product docs, which um, anyone can go on and contribute and help that help us improve these docs. And the reason why we've chose to focus on, on the docs this year is because we wanted the barrier of entry for new developers to contribute to be very low and to be very inclusive so that everyone can contribute. Because if you only open issues that are very complicated, where you ask people to solve bugs or to fix all sorts of paper cuts, it requires a lot of context. So this year, we, we decided to put emphasis on, on inclusivity and letting everyone participate. Very cool. Um, there's another question here about mentorship or like what you do or if you have any suggestions about, you know, when people get stuck uh, building products, do you have any suggestions around mentorship or finding advice and those kinds of things? I definitely am one of these people who very strongly advocate that everyone needs to have a mentor at some point. And um, at least for me, I always like to pick a mentor who is like one or two steps ahead of me and not someone who's like a hundred steps. Like I'm, I'm not seeking for a guru. I'm seeking for a mentor who's, who can help me make one more step in my professional growth journey. And the signal that I use to know that this mentor has done a good job with me is that if after some time we just become friends and the kind of like professional value that I get is is diluted and is low no longer matters, which means that that I've grown and that I've learned. And then I seek another mentor. And this is how I built friends because otherwise I wouldn't have any friend. Um <laughs> <laughs> nice. So um Let's see and, and you would be surprised you know when you ask people if they can if they can mentor you i wouldn't ask the question like that way because it's a little bit awkward but when you ask people to help you'd be a lot of times very surprised to see other people just being very positively receptive to it and, and just accepting at least taking a call and, and helping you um if it's completely like a cold call cold email it's going to be very hard but if you can get some sort of like an intro or some sort of an interaction with that person, you'd be surprised that a lot of people actually are are very much interested in, in helping others. Nice. Uh, we have a, a couple more that we can try and go through kind of quickly before we wrap up here. Uh, will Daily Dev ever become a mobile app? Daily Dev is already available on mobile. It's just not a native mobile app. It's a web app and uh, you can add it to desktop, which is as good. The experience could be a little bit better. We actually plan to improve it a lot until the end of this year. Uh, but yeah, it will be a native mobile app at some point. For the time being, it's just a web app. Nice. Um, how do you see the role of design brand in a more SDK-driven product? So maybe something like that's like very engineering focused. Like, what is there a balance there with regards to design, or what's the most powerful thing design can do for a product like that? I think that the notion that I've just said about the importance of brand applies across the board, regardless of, of what product you build. So of course, like at the core, you need to have a very good product that's functional and the and, and developers should have the ability to get from zero to hello world, like from zero to, to the aha moment, to the value very fast. That goes without saying. But 